Good morning. Uh, this is the uh, meeting of the Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone here. Uh, let's uh, perhaps first uh, introduce the members of the committee, starting with uh, Senator Chittenden. I'm Thomas Chittenden, representing Chittenden County Senate District. It's all Chittenden County minus Colchester and Huntington. Really glad to uh, be here this morning. And uh, what else you're looking for me to say? Representative <laughs> Chase. Uh, Seth Chase, Colchester. So not your, <laughs> your Senate District. Um, I'm also on House Energy and Technology. And I'm Representative Martha Feltis. I go by Marty. Uh, and I'm from Lindenville. I represent three small towns in the Northeast Kingdom, and I serve on House Appropriations. And I'm Senator Randy Brock, uh, the, the chair of the committee. Uh, I represent Franklin County and one town in Grand Isle County. Uh, we're going to start today. We have a, an, an agenda with quite a number of items on it. At some point, depending upon the nature of the subject matter and at the request of the presenter where appropriate, we may go into executive session uh, in order to deal with issues, principally issues relating to information security, data security, resiliency, uh, and, and so on. And all of these kinds of, uh, of issues are, are covered by and allowed for in, uh, in uh, our rules and in law. Uh, we have one new member uh, also who is joining the committee today, and uh, if you would introduce yourself, Senator Pearson. Nice to see you, everybody. Sorry for being a few minutes late. And it's uh, Senator Chris Pearson from uh, Chittenden County. County. Uh, the first item uh, that we have on our agenda today is to hear from uh, the chair, uh, the executive director, rather, of the Ron Community Broadband Board. Uh, and that's uh, Christine Hallquest, who's going to be with us today on Zoom. Just waiting for her to come in. I just sent her a new link. Okay, she's indicated that she's going to uh, to be here shortly. So uh, perhaps we will give her a moment or, or two to uh, to arrive. Uh, she sent a note this morning uh, indicating that uh, uh, that she would be here uh, via Zoom uh, for good reason. Today we also uh, just to fill everybody in who perhaps has not had a chance to look at uh, the agenda. And I believe, Mike, you have posted some presentation materials to our website. That's correct. And our website is available on the legislative website for those who are not familiar with it. If you would look on the legislative website under committees, uh, other, and look for the joint information tech or joint committees and look for the joint information technology oversight committee. And you will see the uh, PowerPoint and other materials that we're going to talk about today, as well as a copy of our agenda. Uh, in the past meetings, uh, we have also looked at uh, the information technology uh, systems agenda uh, items uh, that uh, are being dealt with by the executive branch in some detail. But we have not today uh, yet heard from the legislative branch and the judicial branch. And those are on our agenda today. And this continues uh, something that we started, what was it, three years ago, in which we tried to inventory all the systems throughout state government, looked at who was responsible for them, and then from that moved to kind of a risk assessment to try to understand what systems we have that are substantially at risk uh, and, in effect, risk rank those systems so that, in terms of our efforts, we can concentrate on things that represent true risks or uh, issues that need further work. Uh, we also uh, have a, a block, small block of time at the end of the day uh, to deal with public comment. And so that too is, is on the agenda. Uh, we don't see uh, 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 Director Hallquist yet. Did she indicate? Oh, she's in the waiting room. Oh, she is in the waiting room, okay. That being said, then why don't we admit her to the waiting room, uh, to the screen, and then uh, ask her to present. Uh, good morning, uh, Ms. Hallquist. Good morning, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine. And you're oh, the first perfect. item I up on. You. Great, you're the first item up on the agenda today. So uh, we'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, excellent. Thank you for all for uh, providing the time for me to give you an update of uh, what we're doing. I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen and start the presentation. Okay. 
Can you all see that presentation? We can. Okay. So anyway, sorry, I planned to be there in, in person this morning, but uh, I got exposed to COVID and uh, have, my test hasn't come back yet, but I'm not too worried because I've been fully vaccinated and I've had COVID before and we'll test the science here. Yeah, well, we thank so you anyway, for um, being there. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, certainly don't want to create any additional problems for people. So uh, anyway, uh, we've been uh, meeting for several months now, uh, but I'm very, you know, the progress has been uh, pretty amazing. Um, we started meeting on August 9th. We've been meeting at least bi-weekly. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the board had to get kind of, kind of jump on the train while things were moving pretty fast with the CUD. So it's, uh, uh, you know, I've, it, things are going better than I, uh, better than I thought. Um, hang on a second. Let me just check something in here. Do we have uh, a, a hard copy of uh, this presentation? We do not. Uh, would it be possible, Christine, for you to send us a hard copy of that so that it can be distributed? Uh, it is a bit difficult to see uh, the PowerPoints in the committee room uh, because uh, the size of the, the lettering is such that without binoculars. Okay. Yeah, happy to. I'll, I'll, actually send it. I'll send it to you right now. If, if you could put it on, I don't know, is that one slide or six slides? That's six that slides. One? The BB status is that a single slide? Yes. Well, the present the presentation is multiple slides. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what we're looking right now it says VCBB status and it has six blocks on it. That is a single slide. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. All so right. it would I'm, be very I'm, helpful if you could send that to us. Yep, I'm, I'm doing that right now. Okay. Okay, coming your way at the speed of light with some latency. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're back. Okay. I'll I'll wait till you get confirmation that you received it. email you the PowerPoint, but I'm going to I have to convert it to a PDF and post it to the website. Okay. So you all have to in your inboxes. Okay, great. So anyway, I'll continue. Yeah, please. So, so we've had several meetings. Uh, we've met with uh, most, most of Vermont's telecom providers, uh, as, as well as uh, large national providers as well. The goal here is to, you know, is to uh, get every Vermonter connected with fiber optic broadband. And the goal is to do, take advantage of the experience that the telecom providers have. Uh, the, the whole idea here is have these community owned networks, but uh, use the experience of those providers that already exist. So we've got different models for different CUDs, but we are meeting with both national and local providers. The goal, of course, is to uh, do as much work locally as possible and use local providers, which you've seen some of the announcements that some of the CUDs are working with uh, ValleyNet, uh, as well as um, Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom. 
there, you know, the idea here is using the grant funds to get to those addresses that don't make business sense and put, put it together in a business model that works. The reason, of course, we haven't had broadband in rural areas is because the density is just too low. And even some of those areas, you, density gets so low that even if you built, gave the network away, the, uh, they, they wouldn't be able to support the operation and maintenance costs. So, uh, you know, it's a classic socialization of an infrastructure uh, challenge we're facing here. So far, we've issued $21 million in pre-construction grants to seven of the nine CUDs. And when I say that, the other two CUDs may be taking a different route um, that, that doesn't require the same uh, level of pre-construction grants. The pre-construction grants are funding that it, to get to a detailed design for every address in the CUDs. And when we talk about every address in the CUDs, what we're saying is we really want to get um, every possible town that's covered. Even if the town's not a member of the CUD, we're asking the CUDs to include that in the design because you do this design once and you don't want to have to do it again. The design is a lot of work. Uh, in involves ground truthing, get, getting uh, the, des the design consulting firm uh, gets people out in the field to check some of those poles that on the GIS map may not make sense um, so that it becomes an expensive process. But out of this pre-construction grant, we get a detailed design and a detailed construction plan. That plan is the plan to get every address connected over a five-year period. Uh, very important work. Um, you know, we, if you look at this, this is an iterative process. We start with a high-level design. It gives us kind of a rough idea of the routes, the costs, uh, and helps us to build our business plans. You know, we have some level of confidence, you know, maybe 75, 80% confidence that comes out of that design on the numbers. Then we get into the detailed design and construction that gets us to a 95% confidence level. Um, so we'll be getting those uh, designs completed by the spring so we can start construction next summer. We've uh, seen a great uptake in the interest in uh, getting for the towns joining the CUDs. Uh, so far, we've got close to 200 of the Vermont's 251 towns. Uh, we have close to 400 volunteers working across the state. Um, so, we, and when I talk those volunteers, they're pretty seasoned volunteers. You look at the board members of these CUDs. There are people that have worked in the telecom business. They're either working in the telecom business, they've retired, they've got a lot of business or business experience, um, and they're pretty aggressive. They're pushing us hard. The uh, CUDs have formed the Vermont Communications Union District Association so they can represent the CUDs in one voice. And naturally, you know, similar to the problems that we have uh, with, uh, with, with our democracy, you know, is trying to get everybody on the same, uh, you know, on the same page is a challenge. So the nice thing is we've got an association now to do that. And we've created design standards um, and we're finalizing the construction RFP. So right now we're working with uh, the CUDs to pre-purchase materials with long lead times. Some of these materials, you know, because the whole country is now focused on building uh, broadband because of all the money that's come through the infrastructure bills, we're, you know, we're, it's the lead times for some key materials that have extended some, some as, as long as six months and they continue to extend out further. So we're pre-purchasing material to position it so we can hit the construction season without any delays. We're also addressing the uh, labor workforce issues. The other challenge, you know, that's not just unique to our industry, it's to all industries, the workforce challenges. However, this creates a great opportunity for Vermont because if we do this right, we can offer growth paths for people in uh, you know, lower paying jobs and that growth path through becoming a fiber technician can, will ultimately lead to other jobs in IT as well as, you know, they could move on to electric, high paying electric utility jobs. So we're working closely to build a, a workforce development program. And we're working with uh, some uh, philanthropy organizations such as social justice to fund this with career impact bonds. Uh, that That's real important work because if you look at, uh, what we need. We need about 200 technicians, uh, inside and outside plant technicians. There's, we're probably going to have to, uh, 
to train 600 to get 200 because what we find is when people work from heights, about half of them can't work from heights. And so we those filter out the first couple of weeks. Um, where all the CUDs are committed to universal service plans, where that has been a very, the board has been very firm on that. We, we, we want a plan that gets every Vermonter connected. And we're committed to fiber to the premise. If you look at fiber, to the, I, I don't think that's necessarily debated anymore. Certainly addressed in the telecom plan that fiber is the least expensive solution over the long term and uh, by far prov prov provides the greatest bandwidth. And that real important is we've got some significant funding available that we need to go after aggressively. You know, if you look at the uh, broadband equity access and deployment infrastructure bill that was signed by President Biden on November 15th, there's $42.5 billion available for broadband build out. And that funding includes funding for equity and inclusion programs. So it's not just getting people connected to fiber optic broadband. It's also providing people the devices and the tra training in order to be able to use that effectively for telehealth and telemedicine and other, other important things. So here's kind of a map of where we are. These are the districts. Um, here are the specific numbers. Uh, key is we've, we've got more than half the state's population covered. 90% of the premises Can statewide without access. Christine, I, I think you think you're sharing you know, the, a different screen. All we see right now is the PowerPoint slide that says VCBB status. So I think you might want to share your other screen. We see the oh, first slide. Interesting. Okay. So I think you have two screens and you're sharing the one that's just got the PowerPoint slide deck open and not presentation mode. Okay. No hey, big deal. Me... Thanks. The perils of trying to do things remotely, huh? Let me see if I can find out what's going on here. Uh, slide decks we can follow along, but there you are. To find where you are. Let me get it's it. Me... It's in your email. Okay. What do you see now? Some of the struggles. Some of the struggles. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so let's talk about some of the struggles we're having. Um, you know, the VCB started a year up after the CUDs were established. Our board, you know, and, and, you know, thank you to the legislature and thank you to the governor and thank you to the appoint, the people that appointed this board, a very talented board, um, a number of the board members are from electric utilities and have uh, strong network experience. You know, we've got uh, a, a former telecom um, attorney as, as well as Laura Sibilia. So we've got a great mix on the board. And, you know, that board had to jump on a moving train. And of course, they're asking the, the, uh, the important questions and looking for the data and the information, which a lot of it isn't there yet. You know, for example, trying to figure out how to budget um, is a challenge because we really don't totally know what the numbers are yet. So it's an iterative process. Um, we've had, you know, if I if I were starting up a board and with good management practice, I'd start with board policy development or training. But my experience with that is that it takes about a year to develop your policy. So at this point, we want to keep our top goal for the board is to get to the construction season next year. So there's, you know, we're, we're dealing with the bumps that go along with trying to jump on a moving train. Of course, we're under staff. It's just Rob and I right now. Hiring process takes time. We are getting some highly qualified ca candidates. Well, we just had uh, Stan Maisel start as our general counsel. He's a very seasoned attorney for the Securities Exchange Commission. I'm very impressed, you know, coming from the private business, looking at the the lower pay that the uh, state jobs had, I was a little skeptical on what the talent we would get, but we, we're, you know, we're interviewing right now for executive assistant and uh, amazing the qualifications we have. So I'm very happy with people. People really want to get on these projects because of the goodness that it pr provides to the state. Um, 
Obtaining consensus with the nine CUDs naturally, that's a challenge. Um, same challenge you folks face trying to get, you know, that's, that's the, the messiness of democracy. Um, yeah, the other the challenge too is, and when we talk about money, you know, as we try to obtain funding and we look at funding, there's one, one thing is getting people connected and building the infrastructure to get connected. But, you know, if you've got to pay $200 a month to, to access the internet, that's not a good thing. So, you know, we need the funds not just to get every address connected, but we have to focus on affordability as well. So when I say that $200 a month, the reason I say that is coming, from, you know, if you look at the NEK, um, Northeast Kingdom, if you didn't have any grant funding, you know, it, first of all, the, the business plan just doesn't work. But even if you did make it work, you'd have to be over $200 a month to get connected. So with grant funding, what happens is it drives that cost down, just like your mortgage. You know, if you pay, you know, $100,000 for a mortgage, you pay X. But if it's $200,000, your your mortgage is going to be 2X. So, and of course, Vermonters are impatient. We're getting emails and calls all the time about, you know, I live on this road and this address, you know, when am I going to get my internet? And I've add, you know, with the with the business plans we have, I tell the CUDs, you don't need to worry about the people who are getting the internet the first year. They're going to be happy. It's the ones that are getting it year five. You've got to you've got to really figure out, you know, how to deal with. So the basic model is, you know, grant funding and donations provide the initial funding, build the build the infrastructure. Uh, operator provides a service. We start getting cash flow. Goal being cash flow positive, being able to service your debt year four. That allows you to get to the run bond market. And then of course the revenue bonds pay for the uh, pay, pay for the business plan. Should you not be on the next slide at this point? Oh, I don't, it's funny. I don't know what's holding up here. Okay, let me see. Christine, if, can... if, you, Christine, if you click on your down arrow key on your keyboard, it will advance each slide. Oh yeah, I'm seeing my slides advance, but. There's two screens and I think she's sharing the wrong screen. Okay, let me try that again. There we go. You see that now? Yeah, that's interesting because I put it into, I'm, I'm gonna just show it outside of slideshow mode. Seems like when I put it into slideshow mode, it doesn't advance or I'll just keep going back and forth. I'm almost at the end anyway. Okay, so what's worked? Well, placing the VCBB under the, it, within the DPS for administrative pur purposes and the legislature clearly defined the independence. I must say with pleasant surprise, that's working extremely well. Um, I was a skeptic, you know, if I, you know I, I testified early on in the legislature that it needed to be separate. Uh, that I thought the VCB should be a standalone organization. But the decision the legislature made to put that under the DPS, I believe, accelerated the process significantly. Um, I found June Tierney very uh, good to work with. Uh, she has a lot of experience, and she also uh, understands the independence that we need. So uh, uh, the support I've reached, you know, the other thing I'll tell you, too, you know, you look at the state process. It's a lot of cumbersome state process. Um, but but the employees are over, able to overcome that cumbersomeness because the employees are very responsive. Um, the board's highly experienced, tremendous experience on the board. Um, we, you know, Rob Fish, the technical specialist, whom I think you all know, was already in place for a year, highly respected, transferred to the VCBB. He's uh, a, a wonderful person to be working with. As I said, the legislation is, I think, is well designed. Uh, we we only have one thing we're going to address this year, um, and and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, I think overall, you know, we're taking a minimalist approach to Act 71 changes. Uh, the leadership from the governor has been great. Broadband's a top priority. We have seen tremendous alignment across the agencies. Um, the in terms of communications, the weekly CUD emit. Association meetings uh, with VCB present are good. That's how we continue to keep uh, focusing on alignment with the CUDs. Weekly updates to the governor and the CUDs. I produce one every Thursday night. 
uh, public interest. There's extensive media coverage. And by the way, that media coverage is really helpful because it's good to keep the public informed. And uh, we're having biweekly board meetings with a board that's very deliberative and very active. So at this point, I'll take questions, concerns, address anything you want. Well, let me start just with a, a, a several questions that, that I've had. Um, uh, for one thing, you mentioned in one of your slides that we have 250 of the 251 towns that currently are covered by uh, community uh, broadband uh, organizations. Uh, of those towns that are not uh, covered, what responsibility, if any, do you feel you have with respect to them? <clears throat> Okay, yeah. So the numbers, you know, the numbers two two hundred out of two hundred fifty. Well, it's really one hundred ninety eight. But um, I'm personally, you know, I'm going to be personally the salesperson. For example, I went up to Milton uh, two weeks ago, and 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 there there it looks like they're talking to the Northwest CUD now. I, every every town should become a member of the CUD. So those towns that are reluctant, you know, there's some fears. The, you know, the, the fears that Milton had is, is this is this could cost them money. Um, and, you know, so it, for for the towns that remain, you know, they they need some help and motivation. And I see that as my job, um, you know, working with the town of Colchester right now to convince them to become a member of a CUD. Um, it's you know, I, I think it's a simple answer is if you're not a member of a CUD, you're probably not gonna get connected. And I say that because we're requiring a universal service plan. And for an individual town to develop a universal service plan and negotiate with their uh, different telecom providers, it becomes a challenge. And the town has to allocate funds and really dedicate a full-time person to do that. I don't see any of the towns that are, that, are, that are willing to do that. So when I talk about what it really takes to get this done, they'll become members of the CUD. But I am being very clear to the towns. You know, when I speak to, when I speak to uh, the members, you know, good, there was good turnout in Milton. It was a, something that was set up by, uh, not by us, but, um, uh, but it was, you know, it was, there, was, there was an excellent turnout and I gave the message to the towns folks, join the CUD, it's really that simple. There are towns that uh, I gather are part of CUDs, but have well-developed uh, internet capability through other service providers. Are you doing anything in those areas of those portions of the CUD or are those simply being left on, on their own for now as you build out unserved and underserved areas? Well, the bottom line is every Vermonter needs to be connected to fiber optic broadband. So my message to the cable providers, if you're not building fiber, you're gonna be out of business because cable physically doesn't have the capacity. Um, um, so, so, the, you know, so what we're doing is we're working so, sometimes under NDA to make sure that every, you know, that we aren't duplicating funds. We don't want to overbuild, uh, we don't want to overbuild um, any fiber networks, but we will, Overbuild cable, incidentally, you know, we have to pass through cable areas in order to get to the unserved addresses. If we pass through, we're going we're gonna to put the drops in place. But yeah, the answer is, if, if it's not fiber, then it needs to be constructed. Um, I, we're also working with the regional planning commissions uh, as well it, in order to... Uh, Yeah, I should be correct. We we personally are not working with NDAs. Um, I, I said earlier, working with comp, we we're we're encouraging the CUDs to work with NDAs. We we haven't we're not signing any NDAs at this point. But um, but we are, you know, I do have a pretty good idea of where the fiber is being built because it's it's based on a business case. Well, as you refer to. Uh... CUDs uh, uh, creating uh, non-disclosure agreements with other parties uh, in areas that are served by cable or, or other providers. 
Um, how do you reconcile that with the provisions of 30 BSA 202 that refers to uh, open access uh, uh, for things that we build and support in conjunction with internet expansion? Is there any conflict um, there? Or yeah, are there any provisions that, that you uh, impose that prohibit, prohibit uh, CUDs from uh, entering into agreements that are contrary to what's in 30 BSA 202. Can you give an example? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, what 30, the, the, the provision in 30 BSA 202 says that outlines goals that the state has vis-a-vis uh, -vis expansion of broadband. And among them are that we will have 100-100 broadband uh, currently at this point, uh, uh, by 2024, which we know is not going to happen, uh, that, uh, that, that what we do uh, will deal with open access, a competitive environment, uh, uh, resiliency, and, and a number of other words that describe what our policy is regarding uh, internet expansion. And what I'm really asking is, uh, is what the Community Broadband Board and the CUDs doing, is that consistent with what's in law? In that, in that, well, yeah, in that provision. yeah, that's, yeah. The only thing, the only thing that you've said so far that might, you know, you know might be uh, worth addressing, be, because the other, you know, we, you've already said that we're not going to make it by 2024. That's a law of physics. Yeah, and we have, by the way, a bill that 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 will be pending that will change that date. Uh, okay. That will at least start in the Senate that we we will look at because we know it's real unrealistic currently. Yeah. But on the open access um, issue. Of course, open access is a stated goal of all the CDs. But the reality is, you know, when we look at the unserved areas today, they're averaging somewhere around nine passings per mile. Nine passings, per, if you look at it, the, if, the reason I know where, fi, can guess where fiber is being built, because if you're looking at anywhere over 20 passings per mile, that creates a big, a good business case for the private telecom providers. Nine passing per mile, doesn't even support one telecom provider, let alone multiple providers. So we want to, our first goal is to get those areas served and connected. Um, and, and so, and when we talk, you know, so let's get everybody connected and five years out, we can look at how we can create um, greater competition, but there's nobody competing for these unserved areas at this point. Um, so, and I should also point out, you know, 202, 202 uh, these are goals, not requirements. And the reason they're goals is because, the, you know, I, I believe the people that probably were involved in writing that understand the physics. You know, you got to be careful about putting un, unreasonable goals in place, unreasonable requirements in place. By the way, oh. we are focused on 202, 202C and E. The uh, if you if you look at trying to get um, ubiquitous, you know, cell coverage and and especially if you're moving to five G, you've got to have the fiber network. You got to build the fiber network. I use the example that uh, that 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 uh, I use the example that you can't you know you can't. Why would you buy a refrigerator if you don't have the electricity? You got to have the broadband. So we are working on these aspirational goals. Um, by building that fiber network. That's a question. Uh, Senator Christine, Christine could you, I, I've, uh, thank you for your work and, and it's kind of exciting. It was only a few months ago we were sweating over the language. Um, so it, it's great to see pretty rapid progress. I've always been concerned about um, poor efficiency of utilizing dark fiber that in some cases is already publicly owned and um, you know that in this massive prog uh, pr project that that is after all on an ambitious timeline we wouldn't um, wisely utilize resources that are there because you know we're not talking to each other or they're owned by different factions can you just talk a little bit about that in terms of the planning um, are you, is that, am, am I right to worry about that um, still? Are you seeing any progress? Just give us a status on that point, if you would. 
Yeah, I'll change that worry uh, to, uh, you know, to design goals. Um, that the design goal is to use existing fiber. So just to give you uh, an idea from a detail standpoint, how this works is we, we, um, we, we, we take any of the existing fiber, whether it be state fiber today, whether it be fiber that owned by private providers such as First Light and Velc or, or utility provided fiber, we're gonna use that fiber to get to the hubs the, the idea is we can use that fiber for backhaul. Once you get to the point of design where you're trying to get to, you know, your all of your addresses, you need a lot more fiber. You know, so we don't have enough fiber in, in the state um, today between Velco, First Light, and others to use all that. That fiber won't achieve the goal of getting to every address, but it does provide us the uh, the the middle mile to get there. So the that is part of the design standard is to look at existing fiber today and use that fiber. And it's particularly being used for middle mile fiber purposes. Um, so we are working with Velco and First Light and others. And also, of course, you know, the legislation allowed the state to transfer the fiber network that the state owns to the CUDs and that's in progress as we speak. Terrific, thank you. So, so uh, what about are you seeing an, I mean, is that a cooperative process? Are people sort of willingly coming to the table? Do they, does, is that a financial transaction? Or uh, I, I guess I'm just curious, you make it sound like it's effortless, but you're good that way. Um, just, just help me understand, you know, um, can we have confidence that basically there's gonna be as a as relatively efficient a process uh, as possible, and, and in a related question, there are some CUDs, as I re recall, that kind of envelop towns that already have fiber, you know, and we were worried that you'd have to build around the perimeter as opposed to borrow a line and cut right through a town. Can you just, just help me understand some of those dynamics uh, uh, once again? Yeah, I think your term, borrow a line and cut through the town is good. Is, is the way to address that. Um, what, so getting a little more detail about how the design works is we're, we're using what's called a, a, a G pond or X pond design. What that means is you put a hub somewhere and then you can reach out up to about 10 miles uh, in a circumference from those hubs. So we'll, we're in negotiations. So when I, you know, uh, when I, when I simplify things, I'm always looking at things from a project, project, uh, from a project management standpoint. So I put these things in blocks, right? But it, I never want you to think it's simple. <laughs> it's, it's, so the negotiations with those providers differ. You know, you've got Velco, you've got the utilities, you've got utility fiber, state fiber, and you've got private fiber, privately owned fiber. That privately owned fiber, that's a negotiation. That's a price negotiation. Um, and that's that's ongoing as we speak. And the um, the CUDs are in the updating their business plans to include the grant funding, and 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 taking those costs into consideration. But it is a negotiation. And the whole idea is, we want to get a fiber, uh, a a middle mile fiber through those towns if they have fiber or cable, uh, in order to get to the hub. And the hub can service the, the unserved locations. Um, but if there's existing fiber, we're negotiating to use that existing fiber as a uh, middle mile fiber. So the idea is you can use one fiber to get to your hub, and then your hub will distribute out to, you know, 100, 144 fibers. Great. Thank okay. you. Nope. Yeah. Okay. yeah. One of the issues that some have. Uh, argued for the statewide engineering design. And I know that that's not what uh, exactly uh, is being put in place now. Could you discuss the reasons for doing the approach that you're doing right now and why? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, if I, if I wear, wear my, if I totally wear my engineering hat, of course we do a statewide design and statewide control. Um, of course, the problem with that is it takes a lot of time to do that. I'm, you know, you're, if we took a statewide design, 
to get that done effectively, especially with a public process, it probably takes about two years. Well, you know, my view is we, we accomplish the same goals by developing design standards, which are which we've developed and the board has approved. Well, the board the board's conditionally approved. We're, we're getting some feedback from the, uh, the CUDs on that before we finalize. But we've got those design standards in place. So that's pretty much how the electric, by the way, that's how the electric system is, is in the, this country. We have this National Electrical Safety Code and um, IEEE standards that we build our our electric networks on. We don't require, we don't require, um, we don't require state, you know, the statewide designs for our electrical network. What we require is the electrical network to comply with national standards. That's exactly what we're doing here. Um, you know, we have, uh, I don't know how many utilities, 20 utilities in the state. We didn't design that from a central location, but those utilities follow design standards. So anyway, if we point being, we, I, you know, again, I came into this job kind of leaning towards statewide, uh, statewide design, but the reality is we would lose next year's construction season and probably not be able to uh, effectively use all the ARPA funds because there's a sunset on those uh, funds. So, and also I, sh I should add too there, you know, that the statewide design, because of the time it takes, there, there's a shelf life on those designs too. Um, and, and of course, that's why, you know, we can get into the whole uh, competitive, uh, you know, the, the statewide design versus the competitive world. It, the, the problem is if it takes, you know, it takes you two years to do a statewide design and the technology is changing you may miss some technology opportunities. This is a this, this gives you speed, which is important, and responsiveness, which is important. At the state level, there's a level of inertia that that I I just don't think is effective. Yes. President Chase. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Colchester. I was uh, chatting with some of the tone, uh, some of the folks from the town uh, this week. Um, the message it sounded like they were hearing was that because Colchester is mostly served um, with at least 25-3, there's just kind of pockets that have almost nothing. Um, it sounded like the message they were hearing was that it wasn't in Colchester's best interests to join a CUD, but they're still kind of at a loss for how to access those funds and um, make sure some of our more remote neighborhoods uh, actually get connected. Could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I don't know why they have the message that they, <laughs> that joining the CUD would not be effective because that's exactly what they should do. That because, you know, we, the, the tech, what Colchester will have to do is, um, is they have to create a universal service plan, meaning they have to talk, identify how every single address is going to get served in order to get the funds. So that is a requirement that we have in place. Any grant recipient needs to have a universal service plan. So at, from a town level, that, you know, that yes, they could do it working with a private provider, but it's gonna take a lot of work on their part. Just join the CUD, the CUD is, you know, negotiating under NDA with with the with with these other um, existing providers, so that what really makes sense is for those existing providers to extend their networks um, to get to those underserved addresses for pockets. There's a number of towns like Colchester that have small pockets that it would really be foolish to build a separate network just to get to those. What we really want to do is negotiate with existing providers to extend their networks and provide them the funds um, in order to get to those. But we're not going to do that at the CUD level because we, you know, we don't want to get into those. You know, first of all, that's a level of detail that the CUD should be doing anyway. Um, and but we don't. We also don't want to get into the NDA business. And but the towns could do that. I just don't see that they've got the resources to do it. So I think what you're hearing from the cultures folks will look. The, the, when reality hits, they realize we don't have the resources to do this. So just join the CUD. Do we have a mechanism that allows uh, neighborhoods to join without the whole town joining? No, we do not. 
and I'm not sure why we would even put that in place. Why wouldn't the town join? I guess my my question back to you is, what's what's the problem with the town joining? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> the waste management district. Well, just to follow up on that, so if Colchester joins, and we'll just use them to illustrate, um, and they're and I I think I agree, it, it would make sense in that case to negotiate with the incumbent provider to just cover the rest of the town. But that incumbent provider is only providing 24, three or whatever it is. So don't, that, then therefore they're not, how does the CUD interplay with that? Because wouldn't it be, wouldn't the requirement be that the CUD is involved in, in string fiber? Can you just help us understand that piece? Well, the yeah, the requirement is that they provide 100 by 100 service with their network. So if it's a 25-3 provider, you know, they, they're, they're going to have to show how they get to 100 by 100. The whole idea is to encourage fiber, you know, fiber build out. I, I do believe that all of those cabled areas are going to get overbuilt with fiber over time uh, by private telecom providers. So, um, but on on the short term, we do have other funds available. You know, we could, we we could, and and I'm getting a little ahead of ahead of myself here um, with our board, but because we haven't discussed this with the board yet. But but you know, we have various models, and another model is we not necessarily using um, Ar ARPA funds, but maybe using things like universal service funds. To extend, we could extend cable networks. We could provide funding for that. We haven't put a program in place yet to do that, but we our goal is to get them served. It, where, where, wherever, wherever there there's somebody who's not served, we will you know our our goal is to get them served. Initially, it might be with with a, a cable service, but ultimately over time it will be with fiber. But are there not uh, constraints on the use of uh, COVID-related monies uh, to uh, extend or to deal with uh, places that are already served at 25-3? Yeah, the, the ARPA language um, that's proposed is that you're, you're allowed incidental overbuild. So the incidental mm -hmm. overbuild, and of course, that's, that's a must for sure. Vermont and the nation. Because if you look at how things are built out, and I'll stick to Vermont, if you look at things that just about, a large percentage of our towns have cable in the central town. Um, so the un underserved and unserved addresses are outside of those cable areas. So in order to, and if you look at how fiber routes run, they run to the centers of towns or they run to substations, You've got to run through those cable areas to do incidental overbuild. Um, so, so that we're defining that as incidental overbuild, and right now we've floated the idea that we'll allow up to twenty percent incidental overbuild. Okay. Uh, Senator Chittenden. So, Ms. Halquist, I heard you in your presentation indicate that you would be uh, disclosing by talking about one legislative change that you might be bringing forward this coming session. And I heard Senator Brock mention something about changing the 2024 year, but I don't recall you actually elaborating on what legislative fix or correct or adjustments you were going to be bringing forward. Is that anything that you'd be able to expound upon? Yeah, sure. The 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 issue. And again, you know, we've been through the Act 71 legislation, which is our job, to, with a fine tooth comb. And it's pretty extremely well written. So congratulations to everybody involved with that. Um, but the one thing that we need to focus on um, is the idea that the state will, you know, in, in the unlikely event of a CUD failure, the state will pick up that network, which, you know, become, become you know, kind of become the, the first... Uh, you know, it, it, right now it 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 it's not clear, but it you know we could. It's it's not clear. Uh, we have to clarify how um, you know how that that works because it, you, our goal is to get to the bond market, and if the bond market sees the state as being you know the first first one on the loan, it, um, 
we're probably not going to get the funding. So we've got to work on that language. I don't know what language that should be. It's way beyond my my talents, uh, but I intend to meet with Beth Pierce and and uh, there's a state bond person that I haven't got their name yet, but you know we'll, we'll meet with them and come up with some language that'll work to make it so that it's uh, so that we can go to the finance markets. I think it's important that we try to get that done uh, reasonably expeditiously. Uh, I know I have a, a bill, the bill that that changes the date that's really designed as a placeholder uh, to put in legislation such as that that you're talking about that needs to, to be developed. And I'm not sure if the House uh, represents is the House doing something similar. Not yet. OK. But, uh, you know, we have this this issue of the closing date by which legislation for the second half of the biennium has to be in, which is why I created that. So at least we have something that we can hang this 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 kind of thing on in the event that, that, that it is, in fact, needed. I think we have the time for a committee bill. Uh, yeah, well, that's, yes. that's yeah. So I think if, if that's what we're that obviously is a, that's is what we've been talking. alternative as well. Yeah, um, yeah just to let you know, my goal is to have that within weeks, not, you know, within two weeks to have that answer. But it, yeah, so, so we're, we're working on that as we speak. Uh, you spoke uh, earlier about workforce issues. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how these workforce issues are being addressed, particularly in terms of the development and training of skill sets necessary to uh, be able to execute uh, what the CUDs are doing? Yes. Um, We've been working with uh, the De Department of Labor, as well as the state college system, um, as well as some um, you know, social finance out of Boston to get some fi additional financing. Uh, and I've got a meeting set up uh, uh, on the 14th of December with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. The, uh, the idea here is that we need to um, we need to get 200 fiber technicians and when we did identify growth paths. So one thing's kind of led to another. Um, we, we're, we're kind of, we're, I know there's funds available for training throughout the state. We're looking at how we put those funds together and work again with these public private partnerships to uh, get add money to that through uh, philanthropy. So for example, I'll, I'm just gonna talk about the work we're doing with social finance and career impact bonds. There's, there's significant interest um, with uh, public funders that, that um, there's significant interest with public funders that we, we in this program, the idea being uh, it's, it's a, called an earn to learn program where you create a fund uh, and that fund provides funding for the training and, and the, all the overlay services that are needed such as childcare and, and, um, and, and, and uh, pay, actually uh, pay, them, pay people while they're going through this training. The idea is there's, it, it costs X number of dollars for each participant Assuming, and we work with the telecom providers to make sure they have a career path. And so when they finish their training, they go on the job. It's 144 hours of uh, classroom training. And then it's 2,000 hours of, of apprenticeship, which is about a year working with a private uh, telecom pr provider or constructor. And they, they, this idea is that they, they, they jump into a higher income bracket. And then they pay back that money over time. So you build, a, you do a negotiation with the, uh, the person who's in the program as well as the provider to say, okay, we're gonna pay that back over say five years. That fund becomes self-sustaining. Of course, I gotta be careful with that self-sustaining because it, it does, you know, there are people that drop out of the program and if you drop out, you don't have to pay it back. But that, that'll actually take uh, and It'll, it'll give you two, two to three times the number of, of uh, participants that you would with a traditional grant program. So we'll work, we can extend our grant dollars by using this program. And then the idea is to put people into training, get them into jobs. Now, these national 
the, the social finance says, hey, you know, Vermont's too small for us to take an interest in, you know, can you work, bring other states in? So we've been working with the New England states to make this a New England wide program. And oh, by the way, this program doesn't just apply to technicians, you know, that it, 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 it can work with um, in the medical field with trained nursing, uh, transportation with diesel technicians and electric vehicle mechanics. So now we're going to the ACCD to say, look, this program, let's make this more comprehensive than just our myopic fo focus. You know, of course we want to get fiber technicians, but as we work through what, what needs to happen in order to access these career impact bonds, we, we really need to create a larger pool of interest. So we're working with the uh, ACCD on, on uh, doing that as well. Um, and the idea being, of course, you, 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 we, we have a great opportunity. You know, the, we, we can, we can, people coming out of the prison systems, you know, we can get them into the career path. Naturally, they won't be working on inside plant, but, you know, they can work on outside plant. That's a, 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 a safe place for people to be who may have um, checkered backgrounds. So, and, and it's a great opportunity for people working, you know, for some of these low income jobs to get into higher income jobs. Of course, the problem, of course, is creating enough um, of an incentive for people. If you look at people working in low income jobs, some of them work at two or three jobs and having a hard time just thinking about how they're feeding their families, let alone thinking about shifting careers. So we're trying to put this package together that's attractive for the private companies and it's attractive for the, uh, the potential candidates. Well, based on what you know right now in terms of the timeline for doing that, does it match the timeline for the need for those people, uh, given what the CUDs are doing uh, and moving forward right now? In other words, will you well, have we said, you know, we're working on a timeline to right use in time? Yeah, we're working on a timeline right now that we um, we do the uh, the the career education. You know, pull from the existing uh, job market. Uh, so we're starting that training. The goal is to start that training in January. Um, that's a pretty aggressive goal. Um, you know, the college system believes they can they can meet that goal, but we've got a lot of work to do to to, to hit that January goal. So um, we're, but so that's, that's, that's to meet the immediate needs. Longer term, working with the technical schools, you know, like uh, Stafford and, you know, and um, the, the other uh, high, school, high school technical programs, that, that provides a longer term feed for these needs. Um, we're also working uh, very aggressively with the private companies to say, be very clear with what our needs are. In fact, we're we've we're just completed a uh, we're just completed putting together a survey, um, and and I've been talking personally to some of these telecom providers. Say, look, take this survey seriously because you're going to need these resources, and we need to figure out what we're going to do next year. That it, it 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 is a very important issue to focus on. Do, you know, do we? Can I say with 100% confidence we have all the resources we need for next year's construction season? I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I, but we're doing everything we can to get there. A quick clarification, if I may. Um, earlier, you said uh, something like half the people that start this program working at Heights fall out. I wanted to clarify for anybody working at home or uh, watching at home that that's figurative and not literal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah we, don't, don't, we, Go ahead, please. we don't we don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> You mentioned that among the things that were concerning you from time to time is that there are issues regain, uh, regarding obtaining the consensus of the nine CUDs. And this is kind of a broader question. Is, are there any uh, issues relating to the way the board is operating the way and your relationship with the CUDs and what individual CUDs are doing? Are there any issues of such concern that you think should be brought to our attention? Well, uh, no, I, I don't think there are any issues to be concerned. When I talk about that, it's it's you, you know, you're you have firsthand experience with that. You know, trying to get agreement uh, with a with a large number of independent bodies is is a uh, is a challenge. Um, 
but I, I again I say I'm pretty impressed with how things are moving along. It's uh it's uh it it is a it is a challenge, but you know it's a negotiation just like anything else. There are some CUDs that have have one thought and others have other thoughts. So I I guess I don't see this as a as a problem to bring forward. There have been a number of public records requests made to CUDs and also to the CUD Association. Uh, uh, are there any uh, problem areas that you see regarding responding to uh, public access or public information requests that are coming to you and coming to the CUDs? Yeah, that's been a real problem. Um, and, and I'll say, you know, we, we finally have a, a general counsel on board the problem is most of the requests we, we receive are very vague, um, unspecific. You know, it's hard to figure out what we're responding to. So we're, we're you know, our goal, is, and um, that's the first project our general counsel is working on, is come up with some standardized procedures for how you do general requests and with the kind of information people are looking for. At this point, um, the requests have been very vague um, and very, yeah, very unspecific. Uh, can you give me an example of, of, of what you mean by that? Actually, I'd prefer not to give examples because you get specific. Um, I'll just say that they're poorly written. It, it, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, try to pick an example. You know, um, you, you get an email with, you know, one sentence that says, um, can, you, can you give me all the information related to any work you've done with 202C? Well, I don't even, you know, what does that even mean? Right, because everything we everything we talk about <laughs> relates to 202C on one hand. You know, that's why I need an attorney to answer this question. So, you know, I just take I look at these questions from you know my background and say, I don't even know how to answer these questions. Uh, does the committee have any ad additional questions for uh, this whole quest? Well, again, thank you very, very much then for uh, coming here today. Uh, this obviously won't be your your last visit with us, I hope, and uh, that periodically uh, we, we'd love to have you back to, to keep us apprised of, of what's going on. So thanks and, and thanks for, for all the hard work and, and good work you've done. Okay, thank you very much for your time and all the work yeah. you've done. Mr. Chair, I, yep. I, it's, it's rare in my time in my period that I've worked on such a big bill that so quickly then resulted in some change and it feels really good to hear these feedback and you know we know we are going to have to tweak it as we go um, and a lot of people put a lot of work into that but i think it's just important to just point out maria who uh our drafter who put hours and hours late at night we were probably driving her absolutely crazy and thank you because um, um, it's your product as well for sure and DP. absolutely Let's go on uh, to the next item on the agenda, and that is an update uh, from the judiciary. And we have with us Marcia Shells, who is the Chief Information Officer of the Vermont Judiciary today. Thank you, Senator. I'm actually the Chief Technology Innovation Officer. Ah, uh, okay, that's right. In title. Chief Technology Innovation Officer. Yes, thank you. Great. And um, I believe you have also have hard copies if you um, would like them. Mike. I joined uh, the judiciary just about two months ago. So there's been a lot to learn and there is a lot of change that has occurred over the, the last couple of years and in particular as a result of the pandemic. Um, as a result of the, all the changes and the completion of the next generation case management uh, system, 
it was determined to change the IT organization and increase it to be able to provide better customer service. So the old name was Research and Information Systems, RIS, and the new name is Technology Services Center. And so, so the, we're going to be coming up with a service catalog, but I can name off some of the services we provide our uh, support for the applications as well as help desk. Um, the technology uh, in the courtrooms, the uh, the network, some of this is in conjunction with ADS, um, but uh, in reporting data analysis and uh, information exchanges with our justice partners. So uh, we've incorporated, uh, there was a project team for this next generation case management um, system that was comprised of actual users, docket clerks and um, court operations managers and project managers and those application specialists are now coming into the IT group. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. Uh, this, this really, I've seen this work before where you, know, you really have users who understand it within the IT group who understand the business. So I'm really excited about being able to now to have more integrated customer service. Right now, for instance, we have two mechanisms for help, uh, support help, uh, whether you're calling about the Odyssey case management system, you go one place, if you're calling about your, your word is not, uh, application is not working, you call a different place. We're gonna streamline that and have one uh, central place to call or, or uh, email or text, and we're gonna integrate that in the next year, sooner than later, and as well, we're going to be improving on our reporting and data analysis capabilities because right now we're reporting off of Odyssey itself, which is the case management system, but that has proved to be very limited. And as usual, the online transaction system is not the best place to be able to produce um, reports that are consistent and summarized and follow business rules. So. Luckily, we still have on staff someone who had done this in the past off the old system, the VTAS system, and she will be leading our efforts to produce a, the same off of Odyssey um, for dashboards and improved analytics. So our application inventory is vastly smaller than the executive branch, <laughs> less, uh, uh, less than, well, I believe we have 12 applications, whereas they have hundreds. Um, and I, I have to say, as I was showing the next screen, we are in um, very good shape, I would say, uh, with cybersecurity concerns. Of course, it's something that you constantly want to evaluate, but we'll get to that. I feel um, I feel very, very good, better, you know, than I think they were in before going with off-the-shelf products, for instance. You know, it, they had uh, this homegrown judiciary system for many, many years. And we have, as of August, converted everything into Tyler Technologies Odyssey system. We also utilize in Tyler Technologies a few products that are software as a service, which includes the public portal where attorneys and uh, Vermonters can access case information. And um, in the case of attorneys, e-filing, -E we have that online and attorney licensing. Uh, we, as I'll, I'll mention later, we will be going live uh, in the next year with a jury management product from Tyler that um, wasn't that Tyler, during the period of time that they transitioned to Tyler, Tyler acquired a new product um, that, that improves their jury system capabilities. So we, are, but our current version of Odyssey um, doesn't allow us to take advantage of that. So we will, as soon as our version of Odyssey is upgraded, we will be able to replace um, what we have now, which is Jury Plus. Uh, in addition, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, as a result of the pandemic, we had to put technology in the courtrooms with Cisco, we use Cisco WebEx, um, and we have screens and microphones, um, control panels, uh, so that we can hold remote or hybrid hearings. Uh, and it, we already had for the record, which records and uh, all the court hearings, as well as has transcribing services. 
And then as far as uh, information sharing, internally we use Microsoft SharePoint, externally we use uh, Drupal, uh, and some in-house uh, productivity tools we use are Desk Pro for the help desk to track tickets, and the finance department uses uh, Quicken QuickBooks. So any questions on any of that yet? Well, there have been uh, in the past uh, the ability to look up case information, the ability to look for defendants, for example, uh, by search have varied by county. And in some places they were available, in some cases they were not at all. Is this now a system that is universal throughout the judiciary? Correct. And in terms of looking for case information, is it only case information that is current or after a certain date? Or have you been able to go back at all to the past uh, to do the kinds of lookups that you can do in many other states? I don't know the answer to that, Senator, but I can find out. Okay, would, would appreciate knowing that. Uh, what I've found uh, in the past is that using uh, the judiciary systems to find out, for example, uh, if Marsha Shell uh, has a case pending or has had a case with the judiciary, it depended upon where she was and when. And in many cases, the, it was not searchable at all. In other cases, it was. And it seemed to be dependent upon, uh, dependent upon county. In the past, uh, this VTAG system was not a central system. It was every county had their own instance of it. So that's why I'm sure it varied depending on the, the version of that software. Uh, so that was a, a, you know, that was before me, but I can imagine what a headache that was to support. But is it as of right now, uh, uh, if you have a case pending Currently, within yes. judiciary, are you able to do that search statewide online, regardless of what county is involved? Correct. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you for for doing this work and and uh, coming in on a trying time for us. Uh, I I don't serve on the judiciary committee, so I I don't have firsthand knowledge, but I have picked up in the last year, roughly some frustration around one of the at least one of the systems and the change that's happened for the courts is that the transition to odyssey yes you, you make it sound like it's quite straightforward and successful and and i'm i'm just wondering I, i've been around long enough in my own life and and in state government to see anytime we make a change you know, there's feedback that is, oh my God, it's a disaster, blah, blah, blah. That that goes with the territory. But I'm just curious if you could expand a little bit about that. Was was there a real problem that's been corrected or is it just the sort of nature of making a change? Yeah, thank you, Senator. I think it's the nature of making a change. Um, you know, when, and I have this direct experience from my time at Yale University, putting in a off the shelf product after the, after they had had for 20 years a product that was off the shelf, but had been highly customized. So you, when you're used to something that's exactly tailored to everything, you know, you're used to your processes, it's difficult with a change. But I, uh, we are addressing that angst with, we're going to be stream, like I said, streamlining and tracking um, tickets, and as well as doing additional training. I've already, we've already initiated um, custom training for the judges. And we'll be doing the same with the court operations managers. I think that we can address and get over this, the angst with the change, with improved customer service and training. I really believe that this system has everything that they need. It's just a matter of getting used to it. Okay. Thank you. Representative Nice to meet you. Yes. Uh, and thank you for being here today. Uh, one of the questions that I have a big question that I have is how you're working with the other branches of government. So, um, how often are you meeting with your counterparts um, in the administration and the legislature? I know everyone is completely maxed out, but you are all running Vermont's government together, which is connected. You know, you, you are connected um, digitally as well. Um, so how often are you meeting? So, Can you just talk about that? Yeah. Um, well, I came from the executive branch. I was there for three and a half years, so I know um, a great number of, of people in ABS. Um, I, I, see Kevin. Um, I have not yet met with Kevin. I 
I have spoken with um, Secretary Quinn and with Scott Harvey several times, who is the CISO. I am building out this team. We, I have a, a number of vacancies right now in this new technology services center. So I've been very focused on, I, it, it's on day to day operations, honestly, and learning. And, but it, but I will definitely be meeting with both of them. I plan to do monthly as well as Lisa. Okay. Uh, that's, that sounds great. Um, and I would stress I, it seems really, really important, particularly with, uh, you know, cybersecurity cyber issues. Networking. We also do our purchasing through them. We do our Microsoft licensing through them, ADS. It, it is and, the cyber that I am okay. most, so the okay. cybersecurity that I am most concerned that all three branches of government are, you know, really coordinating regularly, all right. talking have, yeah. with each other and, um, yeah, so I would make a point to even do this before the end of the year, meet with both of them and, and discuss uh, my, my findings and what, what the steps that we're going to be taking. This is something we had started to focus on prior to COVID um, with the three branches. Um, it was not something that existed. You know, of course, COVID has thrown everything uh, topsy turvy, but it just seems even more imperative that it is a regular, you know, how are the three branches working together? To protect right. this, I mean, it's critical infrastructure. Everything is running on it, so it can't be. You guys cannot be siloed. Correct. Yes, um, and and um, and so on this next and gals, excuse me. This this next oh. um, slide actually is a direct result of my work with Scott Kirby and understanding right. how he was doing his uh, scoring of risk assessments, and then I put our applications against that. Good news is our worst. Uh, Risk is only moderate because this, it, the, if you recall, the scores go up to 12, and we have two that are seven. And as well, if we want to get into details about this, Senator, then we can do that afterwards if you like and we go into an executive session. Sure, we can certainly go into executive session to, to go through the risk assessment in a little bit more detail uh, because there are security implications, resiliency implications, and other contingency planning implications that should not be. In the public domain, uh, as as long though as we are uh, at at this point, would you prefer to go into the executive session now, uh, or would you want to cover uh, some of the material on your next slide before? Yes, I'd like to go over the next slide. Okay, we'll come back to this then. So there are a number of pilots and initiatives that we have in progress, and. Um, Many of these will actually even improve our cybersecurity uh, stance. So, um, jury management, for instance, as I mentioned, we're looking at instituting that in the next year with Tyler Technologies and getting off of the Jury Plus system. And what what does that do? Oh, it all right. So we um, it's for it's for being able to pull from a jury a jury poll. So we we load in uh, records from the Department of Motor Vehicles as well as the um, voting registration, mm -hmm. and and then um, jury members or potential jury members can log in and fill out questionnaires, and uh, and that system is used to track and then ultimately uh, reimburse or pay the jury members who participate. Uh, is that information uh, held solely within the judiciary, or is it available, for example, uh, to attorneys who may be? Uh, determining whether or not they want to challenge potential jurors. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Well, I would be interested, I think oh. we, we would be interested in knowing who has access and to what extent to the information in that system. Okay, um, and then Odyssey uh, itself is uh, on-premises uh, in a Tech Vault um, data center and is managed by competitive computing. Uh, Lucy to a, a local company out of Colchester, and we are undergoing a project to improve that infrastructure and it would uh, utilize software from Microsoft called SQL Always On, where we cop make a real time uh, copy of the database so that, uh, for instance, the public portal and reporting does not have to go against the production database. Uh, so, in, in addition to that, we're shoring up some uh, other information security 
uh, findings as they come uh, during this deep analysis of, of the infrastructure. And this is in uh, partnership with Tyler. Uh, each so at the, the next one at the beginning of the pandemic when we had to quickly uh, put all the Cisco WebEx hardware in the courtrooms it was done in a real rush. So we are now going county by county and doing what we're calling a courtroom cleanup, where, for instance, we are um, securing wires on the floor, making sure the monitors are facing the right way, um, and the microphones are placed in the correct places, adding another touchpad um, control center for the judges, and um, and we're doing and we're doing that as I said, county by county, and in conjunction with all the judiciary staff who work in each of these courthouses. Uh, how long do you expect that work to take to be completed? I, I will have to get back to you. It's a matter, it will be months, um, yeah. and, but I don't know exactly. I haven't seen the latest schedule. Okay. You know. I know we have done fit and tip. That was our first county. But on that same point, uh, you are doing this for permanent, uh, you're for permanency. This isn't just like uh, fixing up for this pandemic, but you are trying to upgrade these courtrooms to be able to use in perpetuity going forward. Yes. Space. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, right now we don't have secure Wi Fi uh, in the courthouses. So um, the judge, in order to get to Odyssey, has to be hardwired into the network. And when they leave their chamber and disconnect and go to the bench, they, it loses their settings that so they can't set up in advance. Um, so uh, what, what we're doing are putting, uh, we're calling it tech on the bench, a small uh, computer with monitors and keyboard that the judge can go to and then remote into their laptop, which is the in chambers. That it's um, um, ultimately I would like to get secure Wi-Fi. In the courtrooms, and I say they remote back to the chambers. That's hardwired back to the chamber, um, or wireless. That would be um, hardwired onto the state network. So that the bench setup is hardwired as well as their computer and their chambers. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, what you just described to me sounds very clumsy, but I would love to know if the state or the judiciary is looking into virtual desktop infrastructure. Yes. UBM has now rolled it out and it's uh, national life and just seems like a much more graceful solution to what you're describing. That, that so is definitely on my radar. Yes. We're, we would, we are going to be doing some prototypes of that to make sure that it works well with Odyssey as well as Office 365. So if that all goes well, that's the plan. Why make that investment as opposed to investing in secure Wi-Fi? Uh, well, we're going to be looking at that as well and comparing it. Yes. Um, unfortunately, we don't own all the courthouses. Many times oh. they're owned by the county. Um, some of them are owned by BGS. Uh, so we have we're doing um, an evaluation of that as well. Yes. So this is this was a I I honestly. Um, a surprising issue I discovered. <laughs> the things you didn't know you'd have yeah. to learn. Yeah. Sure. They're, yeah. they're owned by the county. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. in some cases they are. Yeah. The county. Yeah. Well, that's you, a, you get the uh, court and the sheriff. The sheriff. Side, judges, there. side judges on it. Sit. The side judges. Side judges administer it and they have the responsibility. And so you, you go to a county like Franklin County, for example, there are two courthouses. One is the county courthouse that typically handles the civil trials. Uh, and then there is a courthouse that uh, it's the, it, well, it's the extension of the old municipal court system that came, then became the district courts, and now are the superior court criminal branch is in another building, and that is a state-owned building. Huh. So there, there are these hybrids that exist. Essex County, Essex, the county owns the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Who is the county? And it's the yeah. three side judges. Who's the side judges? Literally. Yeah. Side judges are the ones responsible yeah. for it. And there are county it's... meetings and county budget meetings. And in most counties, if you find one person who has ever attended a county board meeting, <laughs> it's a miracle. Right. But that's the way the system works. So one way or another, we're going to solve this problem. <laughs> um, and then, as I mentioned, the uh, reporting, uh, we have desperate need of a business intelligence system to be able to produce accurate and timely 
analysis, uh, which which we have done before. And as I said, it's just a matter of now of mapping um, how this data data warehouse will fall off of Odyssey. Um, a, a pilot, or this is really a, just in the beginning phases, they're looking at online dispute resolution cases and, and what that what that might entail. It's really at the beginning stages, but this they're looking at the um I don't even know, honestly. Um, I don't believe they've actually just uh, determined yet what would be the, the first pilot. Uh, as I said, this is really just kicking off and producing a project charter for now. And then um, our external facing website, we outsource the maintenance of that to a company called Portland Webworks out of Maine. And they're going to be upgrading our infrastructure in January. And when you refer to an outline, external facing website, what uh, functionality does that serve throughout? What are the things that, that are actually done using that system? Um, it's, it's, um, it shows, we, only know we could look at it, yeah, information about the judiciary. You know, it's just, just like, um, the legislative branch has a website. It's, it's a website that is descriptive, but not necessarily functional in Correct. terms of somebody from the outside being able to do something. Correct. So that a, a judge at home, for example, who wants to get into a system, would they use this or would they use some other application? Uh, they would use the Odyssey system was judge. Okay. And they would have to VPN. All right, so, but this is solely, by external facing, it's solely meaning this is something for the public. Yes, is that correct? public facing information. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so I would like to uh, stop sharing. All right, and so at this point, uh, you would prefer that we go into executive session to deal with the judiciary application risk assessment on an application by application basis. Correct. And so for that, uh, uh, I think we may need a motion to go into executive session. And is there a motion to do that from Senator Chittenden? Um, second. Then all in favor of moving into executive session, we will. Just a question, Senator. is there uh, any reason to or not to invite Kevin to stay, who, who is a, our legislative tech guy and maybe could be a resource for us to understand. I, I believe so. I think that would be appropriate. I think uh, it would also be appropriate for uh, Maria uh, Council to also uh, be present. And Scott. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So I would ADS. And ADS. Yes. Okay. So I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Street. All right. So all those in favor of moving to executive session. All right. All right. All right. So we're now in executive session. We'll be back uh, uh, on on air after.